Hello everyone and welcome to my General Hospital official channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Laura and Nicholas hugged at the Flatland Prison's visiting room. Nicholas promptly inquired about Ace's well-being, so Laura showed him a snapshot of Ace's bright smile, telling him that Ace was a happy child. Ace could even say no in three different languages because his babysitter was a language major. When Nicholas inquired as to the cause for Laura's visit, Laura explained that Lulu need his presence. Nicholas had a fast blood test to assess if his liver was healthy enough for a transplant, as they believed he had previously been a match for Lulu's bone marrow when she was small. She stated that as long as his liver was healthy, they would return to Port Charles for a transplant. Nicholas recalls the first time he saw Lulu after donating bone marrow when she was a child. Nicholas swore to be there for Lulu, just as he had promised his boys. Nicholas asked Laura if it was too late to make amends for hurting his family. Laura told Nicholas that she believed in him. He turned himself in, making the noble decision to save Ace from a life on the run. Laura understood what that meant. The test results quickly arrived. Laura was saddened to learn that Nicholas couldn't donate to Lulu since his liver function did not exceed the donation criteria. Nicholas advised Laura that she needed to find Lucky. Dante discovered Tracy sitting quietly in the hospital chapel and asked if he might join her. It helps me knowing that you're here for Lulu if she gets into trouble, Dante told him. Dante praised Tracy for how effectively she had raised Lulu, knowing when to intervene and when to step back when Lulu was a teenager. Dante claimed that she had helped develop Lulu, while Tracy maintained that Lulu had evolved into someone she no longer recognized. Tracy asked Dante what he recalled about Lulu when they first met. Dante stated that she had a fiery personality and was usually up to something. She was confident. She didn't take crap from anyone, Tracy pointed out. Dante agreed as Tracy said, then she changed. She grew uneasy, cautious, and conservative in her attitude toward life. Lulu possessed spirit, determination, and courage. You deprived her of it. Tracy informed Dante that she wasn't finished as he stood up and moved toward the door. That's it, walk away. Tracy responded, if memory serves, you're good at that. Dante said he hadn't altered Lulu, but Tracy countered, you left, and it shattered her. Tracy understood Dante's PTSD, but she reminded him that he had turned Lulu away despite her desire to stay at his side. Dante, if she dies without ever reclaiming that spark from her father, I will never forgive you, Tracy said him. Dante emphasized Tracy's own mistakes, including assuring Luke that she would always make sure Lulu was adequately cared for, even in a long-term institution while in a coma. Tracy sat silently, so Dante described his own actions. His PTSD had scared him, and he was concerned about what he might do to Lulu if he stayed. I realize what I did was terrible, but it's over now. And she's withering away in there, and there's nothing I can do about it, Dante explained. While taking an evening run across the park, Dex noticed Molly seated on a bench. Dex approached Molly and asked whether she was also out for a run. Molly claimed that was her plan, but she had become lost in her thoughts. Molly told Dex that she was doing well. As Dex began to walk away, Molly said it was a lie. Dex offered to call TJ, but Molly said her phone was fully charged. She stated she didn't want to face her family at that time. The funeral was taxing in ways I did not anticipate, and I'm just still putting myself back together, Molly told me. Dex sat down and informed Molly he was available if she needed to discuss anything. Molly revealed that she had blown up at Alexis and Christina, and Dex admitted that he could understand. He'd had numerous fights with his family before leaving home. Molly inquired whether Dex spoke with his family at all. He admitted that he didn't, but he reassured Molly that there was still time for her to reconcile with her own family. So, I suppress my feelings because my sister is a walking disaster and my mom doesn't have time for anyone else? Molly inquired, explaining that she did not want to apologize because everything will return to normal. Molly stated that her mother respected her and met all of the criteria for a great mother, but Alexis had suffered as a result of being a single mother. Any one individual only has so much time and energy to go around, Molly told me. Molly complained that Christina was a mess. 
she's always been and will be. She simply couldn't function without our mother's supervision. Fortunately, I figured that out when I was young, Molly replied. Molly admitted that she didn't want to ask Alexis for more, but Christina would suffer. Dex went on to tell Molly about his own family, including his abusive father. He stated his mother had gotten the worst of it, but he had never told her about it. You never asked your mother for more because you felt she could not provide it. But maybe she never gave it since you didn't ask, Dex explained. Later, Dex sat outside the Metro Court restaurant, scanning at his phone for his mother's contact details. Jocelyn immediately joined him and cheered Dex up. Alexis opened the door to find Rick Lansing standing on her porch. Alexis let Rick in, and he vowed not to stay long because he had an appointment. With Satan? Alexis sarcastically inquired. Rick and Alexis shortly began arguing, with Rick accusing Alexis of taking greater care of Christina than she did of Molly. Rick wanted to chat about Molly. She's distraught, Alexis, and not only because she lost the baby. She's upset with the way you've been treating her, Rick explained. Alexis was stunned when Rick revealed that she had been treating Molly like an afterthought. Our daughter is in anguish, and she is holding you accountable. Rick explained that he was only responsible for a portion of it. I need your advice like I need an acid bath, Alexis responded. Rick asked her to simply listen, but Alexis felt Rick shouldn't be giving parental advice because he was an absentee father. Alexis claimed she was attempting to keep Christina calm, but Rick countered that Molly needed Alexis just as much as Christina. You don't think I want to be spending every minute with Molly right now? Cause I do, but I am one person, and I can't be in both places at the same time, Alexis explained. She believed Molly was better prepared to deal with the loss of the baby than Christina. Rick questioned Alexis about the custody documents Molly had discovered. Alexis said that it was a misunderstanding, but Rick wanted to discuss Alexis and Molly's relationship, which he warned was in peril. Alexis stated that Molly was her daughter, and she was at least present for her, implying that she knew Molly better than Rick. Molly walked in as Rick and Alexis were arguing. Rick left so the mother and daughter could talk. Alexis had hoped Molly would be present to help Christina, but Molly stated that she preferred to help Alexis. Christina is a lost cause. There's no mending fences unless both parties are willing to put in the effort, Molly explained. Molly hoped Alexis would be there for her, offering compassion and care. Alexis promised to do anything for Molly, so Molly posed a pointed question. If Irene had lived, would you have helped Christina take her away from TJ and me? Molly asked. Dante believes she is accusing him of something, and, contrary to popular belief, he did not abandon Lulu. He accuses her of sounding like Tracy and failing to show genuine concern for him and Lulu. He pays Brooke Lynn to break them up in front of her. Carly can't believe he's bringing it up again, she thought they'd moved on years ago. He snaps that it takes a particular sort of person to sledgehammer someone else's life, and she has no concept what that means for Brooke Lynn. Brooke Lynn happened to be listening in. Portia, Curtis, Michael, and Willow all attend Drew's political gathering in the park. Drew praises Congressman McConkie, the mayor, and Willow for being his strongest supporters. He also thanked his business partner and nephew, Michael. Michael asks Willow where McConkie is, as he was meant to be here. Portia moves aside to check on Heather's labs. Curtis interrupts her phone call and inquires as to why she is checking on Heather. Heather was hospitalized last night, according to Portia, and she has hired a new lawyer. Rick Lansing is a person they know. She has no idea what transpired with Scott, and he simply passed the matter off to Rick. She claims to have researched Rick and discovered that he is an excellent lawyer with a winning track record. After the rally, Michael congratulates Drew before leaving to accompany Monica to her latest routine doctor appointment. Willow and Drew are left alone together. Willow praises Drew for his comments about her, and he claims she was the one who helped him understand how much he wanted to run. Willow inquires about the congressman, and Drew is expecting him and hopes nothing is wrong. Drew approaches Curtis and Portia to thank them for coming and supporting him. He also appreciates Curtis for his efforts at Aurora. Curtis acknowledges he's enjoying it, and Drew believes that's evident given what he's done. 
Later, Willow discovers Drew on his own. He's plainly agitated, and she wants to know what's wrong. He just got off the phone with McConkie's wife and died this morning. Willow apologizes. Drew is emotional and wants to discuss somewhere else, so they leave. As the rally winds down, Curtis and Portia locate a park seat to relax and talk, and Portia can tell he enjoys his job at Aurora. She is happy, and he is happy, despite having so little spare time together these days. He thinks she's unhappy. Portia enjoys her job, but the Heather days get to her. Curtis then receives news that McConkie has died. He tries calling Drew, but it goes to voicemail. Portia believes Drew's schedule will be pushed forward, and she assumes he'll ask Curtis to take over as CEO of Aurora. This implies extra work for Curtis. Willow and Drew return to his office, and he relates what Hazel McConkie told him about her husband's death, which was rapid and unexpected. She inquires about the current situation. He expects Hazel will issue a statement regarding his death, and there may be a special election. He may be traveling to Washington, D.C. earlier than scheduled. Drew recalls the last time he spoke with McConkie, who was going on and on about his plans to take his grandchildren fishing. He realizes this is the big family meal, so she should start going. Willow inquires if he is not going. He doesn't feel like it and prefers to stay here. Willow refuses to let him alone because she sees how hard this is affecting him. Dante finds Tracy sitting in the chapel and asks if he can join her. Tracy wonders what she owes this visit to. He just wanted to spend some time with her and thank her for being here for Lulu. He knows she has always held a special place in Lulu's heart, and she has often stood up for her. He gives Tracy credit for who she has become. Tracy yells, she became a person I don't recognize. Dante claims Lulu is the same person she was before she lapsed into a coma. Tracy asks what he recalls of Lulu before the disaster, when they first met. He admits she could be trouble, and she took chances and kicked ass. Tracy claims she suddenly became cautious and hesitant. She screams because Lulu had spirit and determination, which he took away from her. Dante claims that he had PTSD and was unwell. Tracy claims he got treatment, which was beneficial, but he also slept with her cousin and turned down Lulu's aid and love. Tracy claims he destroyed Lulu's self-esteem, and if she dies without rediscovering the spark she once had, she would never forgive him. Dante can live without her forgiveness and claims she can keep it for herself. Dante brings up Luke and how, before his death, he most likely remembered all of Tracy's pledges to take after Lulu as his life flashed before his eyes. Tracy pledged to get Lulu the best therapy she could. Unfortunately, Lulu has nothing to show for it. Dante and Tracy calm down. Dante admits she is correct. Lulu warned him about leaving, but he was more concerned about what might happen if he stayed. He knows walking away was wrong, and she is fading away, with nothing he can do to stop it. Tracy sticks by her words, although she should use better timing, as bashing him up now achieves nothing. Dante understands that she has little need for him, but she is vital to Lulu, and hence to him. He knows she helped Lulu through many difficult times, and Lulu needs her now more than ever. Tracy exclaims, she needs both of us. Dex goes to the Metro Court. He sits in the alcove, looks at his phone, and appears undecided about calling his mother. Later, Joss arrives to surprise him. He wasn't certain he'd see her tonight. Joss explains that it was too late to see Lulu and nothing could be done, so her mother told her to go enjoy her life. He understands how difficult it is to let go of worry. Joss believes there is a chance Lulu will be fine, but things may go wrong. He says they have to pray that everything goes right. Nicholas is released from Flatland Prison to visit his mother. They're both in tears. They sat down, and he inquires about Ace. Laura sends him images and updates on how he is doing. Given the timing of this unexpected visit, he suspects something is wrong. Laura claims they have a problem with Lulu and she needs him. Nicholas has blood drawn and they await the findings, which should arrive within an hour. Nicholas recalls the first time he saw Lulu when she was unwell. He still has a mark on his back from bone marrow extraction. She recalls how he stood beside Lulu, a terrified toddler. 
Nicholas reflects on how he pledged to be there for his boys in the same way, yet failed them. He worries if he'll ever get the opportunity to atone. Laura insists he'll get that chance now. She promises he'll serve his sentence, save his sister, and return home to them. Laura is surprised when the lab technician returns with the results of the test. Nicholas can't assist Lulu. His liver functionality does not fulfill Lulu's requirements. Nicholas does not comprehend, he is healthy and does not drink. She claims his liver is fine for him, but not for Lulu. Nicholas says it will be fine. He reminds her that Lulu has other relatives, and he instructs his mother to find and bring Lucky home. Laura and Liz are sitting in Portia's office together. Portia and another doctor diagnose Lulu with medical cirrhosis of the liver. Her liver failure was most likely caused by the drug she had been taking for the past four years. Laura believes they can adjust the meds, but the physicians say it is not that simple. Thanks for watching if you like this video, so please don't forget to subscribe my channel and don't miss any update.